Hagar. Uh, it's so great um, to have you with us and to meet you virtually, at least for the first time. Uh, I know we've had some uh, conversations over email, and uh, of course, I've been following you uh, religiously on Twitter. Um, so I wanted to kind of get us started by um, asking about you. Can you tell me about your immigration story, your family's migration story, um, and how you ended up where you are? Yeah. So thanks for having me. I love what y'all do. I just want to say I'm a big fan. <laughs> um, we so are yeah. too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm Danny Hajar. Um, you know, I was born and raised uh, just south of Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, I've been here my whole, been the, in the United States my whole life. I'm currently uh, living in Washington, D.C. I've been here for the last uh, 12, 13 years now. Um, both of my parents are immigrants from Lebanon. Um, they came at different times. Uh, my father came in the early 80s, um, was dating my mother long distance, and then my mom uh, joined later in the mid 80s um to the u.s but essentially yeah they are um you know they left during the Lebanese civil war um and came here uh and then have kind of stayed here ever since so <laughs> that's uh that's that's kind of my immigration story i guess is uh it's recent <laughs> i'll put it that way yeah and uh, did they ever tell you what it was like for them settling in, what the community looked like when they came? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, we don't, we haven't talked as extensively about it as I think I'd like to, that, and that's not a knock on them or anything. I think it's just, it's tough to kind of relive that, I imagine, you know. Um, my dad in particular was lucky enough to have first cousins, um, in the U.S. already, so when he moved here, he stayed a lot with them and his uncle. Um, my mom, not so much. My mom didn't have any family here or knew anybody here. It was really through my through my dad that they kind of built that family. Um, we had, you know, fourth, fifth, sixth cousins, kind of very distant cousins that were in the U.S. and have gotten to know and um, have gotten to be, you know, um, they were kind of our family here, right? Um, and, you know, I imagine that it was very difficult. I, like any immigrant story, you come here, you don't really know English as well. People look at you very differently because you're not, uh, well, particularly in Boston, you're not white Irish Catholic. So, <laughs> you know, it looks, it looks very different. Um, and, you know, when you come from a place like Lebanon or really anywhere in the region and you come to the U.S., it's a culture shock. Like it is very much a, a massive culture shock. Um, so, you know, um, my parents are both open people. They're accepting people. They're loving and they, they found a way to make it work. Um, and uh, it's weird for them now that they've lived in the U S longer than they had in Lebanon. I think that's something that is still hard to process as I'm sure it is for a lot of, a lot of folks in that position too. Um, but you know, they found their they found their community in Massachusetts, and they're they're happy, and that's the main thing. Yeah, that, that's wonderful, and thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah. Um, so, I, I what about you? What about you growing up as a Mina kid? Like, what was that like? It was weird. <laughs> <laughs> it was no, it was in the sense of like this, right? Yeah. You know, I didn't have many. Um, I didn't have any other Mina friends really growing up outside of family friends. Um, two of my friends who I grew up with were um, first generation Syrian Americans. Um, and then I had also two other friends who were also um, first generation Lebanese Americans. So they were primarily like my core Mina friends, but you know, um, going to school and everything, I was the only one. <laughs> like middle school and every in elementary school and and all that um and you know as i'm sure you know, everybody can resonate with this sort of story you, if you bring in a certain kind of food or you talk us or whatever you get made fun of and that was not fun um i really hated that um 
it was very much on my big fat Greek wedding sort of like she brought in the, the moussaka and all that and like they made fun of her like that was very much how I felt uh you know at, at in the cafeteria in, in middle school um and then of course 9 11 happened and that just changes so much um for me personally for our community um you know everything i think that's that's the real defining moment i think for a lot of us um you know it was weird for me i remember very much um hearing uh, hearing that the, the kind of the hijackers on 911 hijackers you know speaking arabic and that sort of thing and i remember as a kid being like well if i was on the plane and they understood me and i can speak arabic would they have stopped like that was a weird like that and i was in fifth grade like that was a thought that i was having at such a young age and, um you know my friends uh well not my friends my classmates looked at me differently <laughs> very quickly um all throughout high school i got a lot of i got made fun of and i got a lot of racism hurled my way um from classmates from teachers um i had one teacher uh in my high school uh i'll share this anecdote because i find it funny now but it was not funny at the time i laugh at i laugh at pain that's how i deal with pain <laughs> um so um i went to an all boys catholic school uh, for high school and it was somebody's birthday I, for, I honestly forget who but there were balloons and stuff in the in the classroom and we were about to start our um uh religion class and the teacher takes one of the balloons i used to sit in the front row by the way the teacher took one of the balloons and goes hey y'all who am i and he takes the balloon puts it under his shirt pops it and goes la, 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 like that yeah and everybody starts laughing and I honestly was just very confused. I was like, oh, who are you? Like, a, like the naive idiot that I am. Uh, and he goes, I'm you. I'm Danny. I'm your people. And I was just like, oh. <laughs> like, I don't know what to do at that moment. Everybody else was laughing. You just kind of like nervously laugh along. And then you just take, and I'm someone who internalizes a lot of things. So I just internalized it and just tried to move forward. Um, but yeah, I mean, you name it. I got called, I got called a camel jockey uh you know terrorists san n-word like i'm not gonna you know those sorts of things like i got called all that um um it wasn't really until i got to college and i moved away from boston i came to dc where you know i met other mina people who were not just family friends or friends that i grew up with um and it was a community and it was you know dc as a city is very different from Boston as a city. You know, Boston is still fairly segregated. Um, it is still very much predominantly um, white white city. Um, uh, DC at the time didn't really feel that way. Um, and on a college campus, it felt very different. I was meeting all kinds of people. I was no longer in this bubble of suburban Massachusetts, which was nice. Um, and that I think helped me feel a lot more comfortable with my identity and who I am and wanted to you know, be proud of that. Um, so that is, uh, that's my story. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Uh, <laughs> I, I can't even imagine. I, I don't have a similar experience with my teachers and I'm, I'm sure if, if I did, I, I don't even know how I would have reacted just like what you said. Um, but when you were in college, then were there uh, groups that, that brought you together? Did you join any associations, things like that? Yeah, um, in college, I was part of the Arab Student Association, which was great. And that was a good time to be able to just have that community. Um, and that was, uh, you know, at, I went to GW, I went to George Washington University. And, um, you know, that I fought to make the Arab Student Association part of the Multicultural Student Services Center, which is kind of our, our building for, you know, a lot of different uh, affinity groups um, uh, on identity and things like that. And being part of that larger sort of group was very helpful, I think, for, for not just for me, but I think for our community, too. Um, and we got a lot of support from, from everybody, uh, which I really appreciate. Um, you know, that was, 
I'm happy about that. Like, I'm happy that we were able to do that. And I think that's where I found a lot of community was other other people who were, you know, either Mina or not that had similar experiences that kind of felt a similar way or, um, you know, we all just kind of trauma bonding. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. So it was nice. So is that, would you say, the start of your activism where you became really in involved in uh, public facing work for uh, Arab and MENA causes? Well, I never thought of it as activism. That's interesting. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I mean, look, I grew up with a sense of pride in Lebanon, like always. That was something that was instilled in me and my younger sister from my parents at a young age. Um, that was always something that uh, you know, we would go to Lebanon and stay there for five months out of the year, every year up until I was 18. Uh, and so, you know, I always had that um, desire to want to talk about what was going on and everything. Um, and uh, I don't know that I, that would be the start of my activism. I would say I always felt that pull toward wanting to do better for our community, wanting our community to do better. And I think, you know, as I've learned, I, I've grown and um, I think I've started to really understand and empathize with a lot of other experiences and a lot of other, um, you know, stories too. And, uh, and even just within our own community, what that all looks like, this is very different. Um, you know, relatively speaking, I grew up in a very privileged life. Uh, so what does that mean for me? Am, am I the right person to say something or do something or whatever? And what does that mean to pull in other people that may have a, a better grasp or a better perspective? Like, I, I really think very intentionally about those things. Um, so I think my activism was always there. My desire to want to do more was always there. Um, public facing though, you know, I don't know. Yeah, I, I guess, I guess that was something um, where I really started to, although, no, I take that back. I tried to start the, the, an Arab uh, student organization in high school. I did actually start that, um, but we were like three people <laughs> so it was not it was not a big thing um whereas you know at gw you're, you're throwing on events not just for the community at the university but also for the dmv like you have families adults and everything so that was an that was a good experience also just get to know the the community here in, in the dc maryland virginia area um but my public activism i mean i think it kind of grew from that i've always wanted to speak out i've always wanted to do something i mean i think 2011 in particular was a very pivotal moment for so many people in the region. Um, and I wanted to do my part in just trying to advocate for people. I think that's really just the, the biggest thing. Why music? How did you get into music? What inspires you? You're coming at me with really deep questions. Uh, <laughs> that's that. how I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, I grew up in a very musical house. Um, music was always around us. You know, my mom was very intent on showing us all kinds of genres. I mean, she would have cassettes of, you know, classic Lebanese, Egyptian, Syrian singers, um, you know, Broadway uh, musicals, um, pop star, like Western pop stars. Uh, it really kind of French pop, like she was very big on French pop. Like it really kind of ran the gamut. My dad, you know, similarly, he was very, at the time, you know, would expose us to a lot of like Depke music because he loves to do that. Um, but also a lot of um, Spanish and, and Latin uh, artists as well. Uh, he really has a thing for Julio Iglesias, which I think is wonderful. Uh, <laughs> um, um, so we grew up just constantly surrounded with music, like constantly in our house, in the car, or whatever it was always at. Um, and I, you know, I played piano for a part of my life. So I was also just very musically inclined. Uh, I taught myself how to play the Derbeki. Like I really wanted to learn how to play it and try to teach myself and that was fun. Um, but I love music. I just, I think music is this intrinsic sort of, part of us that is able to express an emotion that we can't accurately express or feel um, with words. Uh, even the music, I guess, is, <laughs> there are lyrics, yes. <laughs> but um, it's, 
it's an interesting thing how we can all connect through a, an artist or a song or what have you. I think music is something that we all have a connection to one way or another, whether it's, you know, your kind of conventional music for pleasure sort of um, uh, piece of it, or it could be religious, it could be whatever it may look like. Um, I think it's that, that part is always fascinating to me. Um, for this newsletter, when I ask, you know, uh, people, people that I admire, people that I think are doing incredible work for our community, when I ask them to share their go-to songs with me, you know, I get a lot of, I'd love to, but don't judge me if I choose X, Y, Z, or, oh, I'd love to, but I don't have cool music. And I hate that answer because <laughs> I don't think there is a such thing as cool music. I really don't. I think what makes it cool is how you connect with the song or how you connect with the music itself. That's cool to me. You know, I may not connect with Taylor Swift as deeply as somebody else, but I'm not going to sit here and knock her artistry or her creativity or what have you. If someone else connects with that on a very deep level, that to me is very cool. Um, so that's how I try to approach music and how I try to approach, um, um, you know, uh, people's stories with, with the music. No, that's so great. So great. And I want to know now, well, kind of talk to you a little bit about Salonat and Ness and how that came about. Yeah. Um, you know, in 2020, when the pandemic <laughs> really came through, um, I have been toying with this idea for a little bit anyway. Um, you know, during that time, I kind of went down much more of a rabbit hole of, okay, well, aside from the sort of Arab pop scene, We've got other artists, we've got other genres that are cooling that are and other other songs are all really interesting. The artists are doing really cool things. Um, and I went, you know, on kind of a rabbit hole of a lot of different in a lot of different places. Um, Morocco, Algeria, Sudan, um, Mahraganat in Egypt, like just a lot of really interesting scenes. And I have been toying with this idea of, okay, well, I want to start making playlists and like show other people, like, hey there's a bigger world out there outside of, you know, Nancy Ajo. So uh, I have been thinking about that for a while. And then August 4th happened and the Beirut blast happened at the port. And, you know, I remember just kind of being here in my apartment, seeing that happen, um, really worried about my family and my cousins and everything there. Um, and feeling kind of helpless, like feeling like I couldn't really do anything um, and having to act like as if, as if I had to just go about my day as if nothing was happening, you know, cause I was working at the time. Um, and I saw people that didn't necessarily have a connection to Lebanon, didn't necessarily have a connection to the region, talk about what was going on, suddenly create GoFundMes, create these lists of resources or, or whatever. And I wanted to capitalize on that. And that was kind of the, the tipping point for me was, you know, thinking, okay, this newsletter or this sort of initiative, it has to go beyond music. I can't just let it be a music thing. It has to be something where I feel like I'm doing my incredibly, incredibly tiny, 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 small part in um, making sure that people are informed of what's happening in Lebanon uh, and keeping, um, you know, those political elite and uh, the government accountable. And so this newsletter kind of was born out of that was, yeah, I'm going to share some music. I'm going to share some cool cultural things because we don't really have that in English. Like we don't really have like an easy go-to um, resource for all of those things um, in English. And I wanted this to be particularly for the diaspora who wanted to connect and wanted to know about what was going on, but didn't know where to start. Um, so it's going to be part of that. And then part of it is also going to be, okay, well, here are some stories about Lebanon that I'm gonna highlight every single week. Here are some stories about the Middle East and North Africa and that I'm gonna highlight every single week um, and some other things too. But um, I wanted to keep, continue sharing those pieces. I wanted to continue talking about it. Um, so that was how the newsletter kind of started. And then from there, you know, I wanted to highlight other cool people that were just doing incredible things in our community that people didn't maybe know about. And, that to me is the most rewarding thing um, more than anything else. Cause I selfishly want to connect with people <laughs> and just like nerd out with them. Um, 
but we have such cool people both in the region and just throughout the diaspora that are doing amazing, amazing things. You know, I've gotten to connect with artists, with academics, with researchers, with chefs, with, um, you know, you name it. Um, and it's just so freaking cool. Like it genuinely is just the coolest thing. And what I love about it is we're all connecting through music, you know, like I'm not asking them about their job. I'm not asking them about, about, them about their career. People, I want people to understand that, you know, we are more than what we do for a day job or what have you. Um, we're a holistic being. And so music is that way to be able to uh, kind of highlight that. And that's been the biggest compliment that I've ever gotten is from guest features and, and things like that who have then said, thank you for asking me about something that isn't my work because this is a nice escape for me and this is a cool thing to have to answer and it, and it makes me it challenges my brain in a different way to have to think okay what song do I know all the words to or what song gets me uh in my feelings or whatever so uh that has been the biggest thing and I really I really love that part of it yeah I mean I think I, I emailed you afterwards and I'm like thank you for all the memories like I just sat reminiscing yeah. for a day <laughs> <laughs> no I love that like that's the thing right is um, I want people to remember, oh, yeah, like I do connect with the song. Why do I connect with the song? That is that to me, the story is the cool thing. And I get people who share like these beautiful, beautiful stories. Like some of them are heartbreaking. Some of them are, are you know, really nostalgic. And then I get people who are just like, you know what? I know all the words to this Little Wayne song because it's hella dope. And that was it. And I love that. I love that, too. You know, um, I love all of it. I really, really do. Yeah, no, so do I. I I really really do and I I love Salonot and Nas I think that it's such a fresh and interesting way to approach people and to to introduce so much happening and so many really like incredible people um in in the diaspora as you said what you're saying got me wondering and maybe this is you know a difficult question how do you see our community and how do you see uh, the Lebanese diaspora and, and those around you, where do you fit in? You know, for me, how I see myself is just as a connector. I just want to, I just want to connect people. I want to highlight cool people. I want to big up them. Like, you know, yeah, I'm the, I'm the one putting together the newsletter. I'm the one that's curating playlists, but it's not about me. And I really, I really mean that. Like I, I don't need all the praise. I don't need all the attention. I'd rather not, <laughs> I'd rather the attention and the praise go on the guest features um, or the artists or, you know, the, the reporters who are writing all these different stories like that for me is, is why I do it um, and why I put this together. And so I think my role is, I see myself as kind of that connecting piece of, you know, if I know one person that's doing one initiative and I know another person that's doing something similar in a different place that, or may have ideas or thoughts on all these sorts of things like that is where I will, um, you know, I'll connect and everything. And I want to put those two people together. Um, and I've done that. And that's been the coolest thing. Like I've connected people who live in Chicago with someone who lives in the Netherlands and someone in, you know, in Tunis with someone in LA, like things like that have just been fascinating. I love all of that. Um, and I want us to all find a way to not just celebrate our cultures and our music and our art and everything but respect our differences um you know i think that's huge and you know tunisian art and culture and that sort of thing is going to be very different from egyptian art and culture or lebanese art and culture or iraqi or yemeni or what have you and there's beauty in all of it and i think at least on a on an artistic and cultural level there's there's opportunity for some sort of uh unity there um, and some sort of just mutual admiration and respect for what we're trying to do um, and it's all beautiful like it really is um, so you know for me I, I just want to continue doing that um, now as far as the Lebanese diaspora I don't know what my role is I think I'm still trying to figure that out I want to be someone that's continu that continues to be vocal for um you know, the betterment of our country and for uh, our communities. Um, 
but that's an ongoing <laughs> that's an ongoing journey and a battle um you know it's we just had elections what two weeks ago now three weeks ago now um and it's tough when you know i live in washington dc and i went to go vote at the embassy and i'm voting for independents people that are not tied to any sectarian party uh because i don't like any of them uh and they've done nothing for me um and it's tough when you go there and then you see giant flags for all these sectarian parties and it's very you know still tied to that and um and these are diaspora like these are people that you know i'm thinking at least in, in theory or on paper should know better by now <laughs> something along those lines um and it bought it's tough when they're still voting for those same people those same parties the same sectarianism and that sort of stuff and um that's still their mindset and so we've got a lot of work to do um granted that's one diaspora community that's one lebanese diaspora community there are others that are probably a little bit more progressive that or 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 you know more open-minded and thinking differently um but we got a lot of work to do i think as a as a diaspora um and each diaspora community is very different and i think that's something that is uh that we're trying to that i'm trying to understand and, and figure out and see where where commonalities where differences kind of come into play you have this incredible thing out there and you are, as you said, a connector. You are facilitating all of these conversations and introducing all of these wonderful people. How is that being received by your immigrant communities, I suppose? I hope they like it. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, like, look, I, you know, I always, every week that I put the newsletter together, I always, I really always think, do people actually engage with this? Do people actually like this? Or do I have an inflated sense of self? Especially living in DC, there are a lot of people who live here and work here that have very inflated senses of self. <laughs> okay, this is a very egotistical city. So I don't want to fall privy. I don't want to fall prey to that. I don't want to uh, see myself as, well, I'm doing this important work. I'm putting together a newsletter. Okay, it's really... It's not, there are other people that are doing grassroots organizing that are, um, you know, trying to change laws and policies and things like that, that are doing that work. I'm putting a newsletter together. Like, I don't want to sit here and say my work is just this incredibly important thing and it needs to be what, no, it's really not. I see my, like, I, I just, I hope that people like it and I hope that people engage with it, whether that's one subscriber or a million subscribers you know for me i don't care how many people subscribe to it or not what i care most about is the quality of people like are the are people who are engaging with it gonna actually sit and try to check out all the different songs try to read all the different stories like do they feel like it's useful to them do they feel like this is something that um they find is uh you know helpful um is it escapism for them even if it's just for like a moment or two you know we our community, our broader you know, diaspora community, our broader arena community locally, mm -hmm. we go through traumatic stuff <laughs> every week. There's always something happening, um, always. And, you know, I, I don't, I'm not, you know, ignorant to that. I understand that because I'm going through it too with everybody. Um, and I don't want the newsletter to come across as ignorant to that either. Um, you know, for me, when we go through those moments of trauma and moments of, of grief and frustration and anger, like, I want the newsletter to be something where, okay, you know, you're holding space for some sort of escapism and some sort of joy, even if it's just for two minutes, because we need that too. Um, so I don't, I never want the newsletter to, to come across as aloof, if that makes sense. I never want it to be something where, you know, a journalist gets gets shot and killed in Palestine for doing her job. And then the newsletter is like, hey, everyone, check out this awesome music. No, that's, you know, for me, when every time that something like that happens, I will take moments um, in the newsletter, take some space in the newsletter to talk about that and engage with that. Or, um, you know, you'll see stories that are about what's going on and about, you know, obviously I'm talking about Shirin Abu Atna, so I'll, you know, there are going to be stories about her, for example. And, um, and I'll even do that through the music honestly, Michael, like I'll do that through the music too. You know, if, if the Egyptian music syndicate 
hands down a new band on on Maharaganat artists, the playlist that week for the newsletter might be all Maharaganat songs. <laughs> you know, like it'll be subtle. It'll be little things like that that I'll just be like, you know what, here we go. Let's let's try to do that. So, um, you know, and I'm, it's very much a part of it's the newsletter is supposed to be something that is understanding of what is happening uh, and it's supposed to be timely. Um, so I hope people engage with it. That's really the biggest thing. I really do hope people like it and, and want to read it. Well, everyone I know is reading it. So that's something. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and shifting gears, Moon Knight. Uh, oh, yeah. Tell me <laughs> about Moon Knight and tell me about your, um, well, your views of it and the impact it's had uh, just on our communities um, and the responses. You know, I've never been jealous of Egyptians until this moment, man, until Moon Knight came out. And then, I'm sorry, I'm going to talk about Moon Knight and there are going to be a lot of spoilers for anybody that's watching this. Just know that in advance. But uh, man, that last episode when they're like, and the superhero Masriya, and she's like, oh, I was like, oh man, <laughs> like, I, I want to be, I want to be Egyptian, bro. Like I, I flipped out. I honestly flipped out. Um, no, Muna is just, it's done, but see, that's, Muna is a great example of how when you get the right people in the creative spaces, when you get the, the right people consulting, you get people that understand the culture, understand the Egyptology of everything. Um, it can be this great series. Now, I do think the series kind of failed the comics in one sense, which is I do wish that they better spoke about and explored, um, you know, Mark's Jewish identity. I think that would have been kind of, that would have added a very interesting element to the series itself. Um, you know, that being said, they did an incredible job with the Egyptian-ness of everything. I mean, the portrayals of Cairo, um, the Arabic is proper Egyptian dialect. It's not something else. The music, which I know I've talked about at length on Twitter and I will rave about all the time, but come on, like to hear Warda as like Black Panther and Captain America, whatever, like all the superheroes come through on the Marvel intro. I was like, I I almost cried. <laughs> like almost, um, I never thought I'd hear that in my life. Um, so it meant a lot to me and I hope that they bring back a season two. <laughs> I really do, but it was just, it was cool. And it, and again, it shows that, you know, people can get excited about our communities in, in, in this way. Like, there's no reason why more stories like ours can't be told. It says a lot that the first thing that you said when I brought up Moon Knight is that last scene from the last episode, right? It, it says a lot because it, it really became this, this huge thing. And I know me, like for myself, it was so great to see. And I can only imagine, you know, young kids, especially, you know, having having spent time interviewing second generation and uh, Egyptians in, in Canada and, and spending time with them and understanding their stories. Having that on TV is incredible. It's 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 affirming. It's a sense of visibility of, of, of being here. Um, and. I want to ask you, I think, to kind of wrap things up about where do you see yourself going and, and, the, and the, the newsletter going in, in the coming years and, and what impact do you hope to achieve in those years? Yeah, that's a good question. I would love to see the newsletter become its own sort of larger platform where whether it's me or other people that I can pay and, and who are much more thoughtful and much more steeped into this research and, and knowledge than I am, uh, I want it to be a place where we talk about our music and our culture in a much more nuanced and thoughtful way. Um, you know, I think those resources exist in, a lot in Arabic. I think there are maybe a, a handful that exist in English. But a lot of the stories that come out about our songs, in particular our music, is, oh, you know, Amr Diab dropped a new song. Check it out here. Cool. Okay. Well, let's put that in context. What is it, like? What, is, what does the song deal with? What's going on in Amr Diab's life right now that would make him create this sort of song? Or 
whatever, you know, or, you know, the industry continues to promote artists like Saad Limjarad and we all kind of, and we, uh, when I say we, I mean consumers, uh, you know, kind of still pro listen to him. We still support him. Um, I want to see someone write the story of, about his th three sexual assault cases, one of them ongoing uh, in France and the United States. Like this, it's across two countries. Like this is insanity that we would still promote an artist like this. Like I want someone to write about these things or talk about um, the racism and sexism in the, in the music industry in the region. Like let's, let's be very vocal about these things. Like let's do deep dives on these things. Um, so I want that kind of um, platform to exist. I want the newsletter to be something like that. And I want, you know, us as a broader MENA community, locally and in the diaspora, and frankly, the next generation after me, whatever, um, to be able to think critically about our culture, think critically about our music. Um, and it doesn't have to be in a bad way, but just contextualizing everything, um, you know, talking openly about it um, and showing people who aren't tied to us that we've got, we've got cool stuff too. Like <laughs> we do, we do really cool music. Um, so I hope that, I hope that for our, our music in particular and our culture, uh, I want that to be something that we can openly discuss and openly talk about, um, uh, you know, beyond just our own communities and beyond social media. Like let's have a platform that's dedicated to that. I think we already have one. Uh, you're just, it's waiting for you to build it up. <laughs> Inshallah. <laughs> yeah. I need money. That's what we yeah. tell <laughs> uh, Trust me, I'm right there with you. <laughs> um, well, thanks so much, Danny. It's been a pleasure, honestly, getting to know you and sharing all of these incredible stories with um, our audiences. And um, I'm, I'm so excited to see everything that's to come from the great Danny Hagar. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you, man. Uh, you know, the work that y'all are doing with Egypt Migrations, I, I really got to say, like, it's incredibly important. I think it's the coolest freaking thing. Um, and I love how quickly y'all have grown. I love how quickly y'all have gotten this attention and respect that is well deserved and I know how much thought and energy and time and work that you're putting into something that I can I know you love and I know that others really really love and um you know since this is recorded I will say in case people didn't know Michael was one of the guest features so y'all gotta check that out too that'll be a link that we'll include along with just subscribing to the newsletter people need to read about you too so I just want to say thank you and it's an honor for me um, to be able to to be part of this and to talk to you about everything too the honor is all mine Danny thanks so much